Good day everyone, Kermos here with another DCS video and this time I want to take a look at attack helicopters. I still hope we get the Mi-24 Hind or a AH-1 Cobra from Pilsum Tech one day, though nothing is sure yet, but if we do we would have a nice amount of helicopters in DCS that are at least capable of being used in an attack role. So with this in mind I thought it would be fun and interesting to do a video on the evolution of attack helicopters and the tactics used by them. Nothing in depth, just an overview and a bit of an explanation of some of the basics of how for example the tactic used by a Mi-24 Hind differs from that of an Apache and why. Well, but let's start at the beginning. Attack helicopters of course date back to the early 60s and even 50s and while some attack helicopters were used in the 50s already, for example French Alouette 3 using SS-10 missiles, the real kickstart to helicopter warfare and attack helicopters is the concept of air mobility and helicopter assaults in the 60s. First helicopter assaults inserting troops via transport helicopters already happened in the 50s on a limited scale with early piston engine powered helicopters. That is when the concept of air mobility was originally developed, giving troops on the battlefield more mobility via the helicopter and therefore be more flexible in reacting to enemy movements, able to outmaneuver them or attack in force at an unexpected location. And at the start of the 60s, with more powerful helicopters like the UH-1 Yui available, this concept was put to the test at a large scale for the first time. And while the concept was proven to be a success in those early days of air mobility, it also showed the need for armed helicopters, both self-defense armament for transport helicopters to provide suppressive fire when they were landing in a landing zone, but also dedicated close air support helicopters to provide close air support and escort for the transport helicopters. Now in case of the US Army, the role for close air support from the air would of course be the job of the US Air Force. However, in the 50s and early 60s, the Air Force's focus was very much on nuclear bombers and fast interceptors, with many people believing at the time that conventional conflicts at any kind of scale would be a thing of the past and instead a future war would be a nuclear one. The army worried that with the air force being preoccupied with fast bombers and interceptors would have only a limited capability to provide close air support for their troops on the ground, with fast supersonic strike aircraft simply not being very well suited for this task. And indeed, the US air force at the time did not worry too much about close air support aircraft. Early in the Vietnam conflict, for example, this role was taken over by the T-28 trainer aircraft. The A-1 Sky Raider would of course later become famous for its use as a close air support aircraft in Vietnam, but it was of course developed decades earlier for the Navy, and while fast jets can of course be used for close air support as well, they are simply not as well suited for it, especially back during the early days of Vietnam, without the modern guided weapons a jet would have access to now. And inter-service rivalries made it difficult for the army to develop and operate its own close air support planes. A possible solution for this was to arm helicopters instead. So during the 50s a number of tests were conducted including some interesting experiments like a B-29 turret fitted to a H-1 helicopter for example. And those tests led eventually to the armament subsystem that were fitted to the UH-1, turning it into a gunship. Those UE gunships and aerial rocket artillery were pretty immediately put to test over Vietnam. Now, today when we talk about the tech helicopters, what many people will associate with them and their tactics are helicopters hovering at low altitude, using trees and hills as cover to stay out of sight and attack from such a hidden position. But that was of course not always the case. In the 60s and early 70s over South Vietnam, the exact opposite was the case as a matter of fact. Hovering at low level would generally be considered suicidal and that makes sense of course. Over South Vietnam where helicopter operations usually took place, the main threat to helicopters was small arms fire, a lot of the times. The supply lines of the NVA were pretty long and they had to bring their weapons and ammunition down through the jungle over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so their weapons employed against helicopters at the time were mostly small arms, with 50 caliber Tushka machine guns being the heaviest anti-air weapon encountered most of the time. Though not always, in some battles, for example in the Asha Valley, US also had to deal with heavier 23 and 37mm anti-aircraft guns, but that was not the rule. A good defense against small arms fire is to simply stay high enough to be out of effective small arms weapon range most of the time, especially in an environment like the Vietnam War, where the terrain would give enemy soldiers good cover and concealment. 
As a result, attack helicopters at the time would stay at higher altitude when possible, 1500 feet or more to make a harder target for small arms fire and attack in a shallow dive towards the target. A helicopter is not invincible to small arms fire at this altitude, but hitting a somewhat fast moving target without aiming help or dedicated AA weapons is difficult. So the higher altitude at least reduced the risk of getting hit to acceptable levels. Now, the weapons on the deck helis at the time itself were not very sophisticated either, usually 70mm unguided rockets and rifle caliber miniguns or machine guns. Early guided anti-tank missiles like the manual command line guided SS-11 and later the first TOW missiles were tested and used in small numbers towards the end of the 60s and early 70s, but never used in large numbers. Neither the UH-1 Yui gunship nor the early AH-1G and AH-1J Cobras during the Vietnam War had stabilized optics like on more modern helicopters, nor ballistic computers to help with the employment of unguided weapons. You have to set bullet drop manually in the sight and use the good old Kentucky windage for lead. As a result, effective range was low compared to modern helicopters and you have to get close to the target for effective attacks. So even if you are above small arms fire range before your attack run, you will generally have to get closer in your attack run. Another reason to stay fast, fast for UE standards that is, to present a harder target when you climb away from the target after the attack run. The older 70mm rockets used at the time were reportedly also very inaccurate at low air speeds. All of that leads to the way attack helicopters were employed over Vietnam, at least for most of the war. UE gunships and Cobras would stay at higher altitude and attack in a shallow dive at speed. Often gunships would also work together with small scout helicopters, which probably had the most dangerous job in the air over Vietnam. The OH-6KU called Loach or the AOH-58 Kiowas, which would dart around at low altitude trying to find enemy positions and often doing so by getting shot at, with the gunships above ready to fire on the attacker when this happened. Now, with the concept of attack helicopters proven a success, the army started to look for a replacement for the UE gunships. A dedicated attack helicopter which was to be much more sophisticated than an armed transport helicopter. Lockheed managed to secure the contract for developing this new attack helicopter, called AH-56 Cheyenne. In line with the tactics in use by the UE gunship at the time, the new helicopter was to be optimized for high speed. It even had a pusher propeller at the rear to make it faster. Also a retractable landing gear for better aerodynamics and large wings, not just for carrying weapons, but also to create lift assisting the main rotor at high speeds. So that the helicopter would be a more difficult target and the time it was exposed to fire during a deck run would be decreased. While this new helicopter had improved armament and though anti-tank missiles were envisioned as part of its arsenal against tanks and hard targets, its main weapons in close air support role were still the 70mm rockets, machine guns and a 30mm cannon, used in a shallow diving attack similar to what the UE gunships used, though much faster. This focus on speed is typical for the prototypes of this first generation of pure attack helicopters, though few of them entered service in the end. Since the for its time very complex and sophisticated AH-56 was however expected to take some time in development till it was ready and the army needed a better attack helicopter than the UE sooner, Bell also got the contract for an interim solution. An attack helicopter Bell suggested which was based on UE components but with a much sleeker fuselage making it much faster. This interim solution was the AH-1 Cobra, and as it often is the case, stayed in service while the helicopters developed to replace it did not enter service at all. Now, as I've said, the attack helicopters that were developed at this time focused on, for a helicopter, high speeds. The AH-56 Cheyenne, for example, or the Sikorsky S-67 Blackhawk, which Sikorsky started to develop as an alternative to the AH-56. One attack helicopter of this generation that, unlike the Cheyenne and the S-67, actually entered service was the Mi-24 Hind. The Hind, like the AH-1 Cobra, was not a completely new design, but used parts of an existing utility helicopter, which made development faster and cheaper. But on the Hind, you can still see the typical trademarks of attack helicopter development of this first generation. A sleek shape, retractable landing gear to gain more speed, however, this also makes the helicopter heavier. As well as large stub wings that carry weapons but also provide lift at high speeds, increasing the performance of the helicopter at higher airspeeds. 
but while attack helicopters got more sophisticated, so did anti-air weapons. Most notably, the shoulder-fired infrared-guided anti-air missile, often called MANBATS, made an appearance in the late 60s and early 70s, and by 1970 or 71, Strela MANBATS started to show up in Vietnam in increasing numbers, and that of course was a game-changer because staying out of small arms weapon range suddenly put helicopters in comfortable range of those shoulder-fired SAMs. On top of that, operations like Lamson 719 in 1971 into Laos to try to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail there showed again, if it wasn't clear already, how vulnerable helicopters flying at altitude were to anti-aircraft weapons in general, if the enemy had access to them. But now, with the introduction of MANPADs, anti-aircraft weapons could show up pretty much everywhere, since Estrella is a lot easier to move than a radar-guided anti-aircraft cannon. As a result, tactics changed and attack helicopters, UE gunships, Cobras and eventually also the Mi-24 Hind helicopters were now mostly flying at treetop level to reduce exposure to SAMs and other anti-aircraft weapons. That, of course, put them at a higher risk from small arms, but in any case, this led to the kind of attack pattern that many would associate with the Mi-24 Hind, flying at high speed, that is what the helicopter is optimized for, and low altitude to reduce exposure to SAMs and other anti-aircraft weapons, bob up and hopefully surprise an opponent, attack and use the helicopter's high speed to get back into cover fast. The Hind, of course, also has ATGMs with longer range, but when the Hind originally entered service, the ATGMs available for it were still old manual command line guidance models, and it took a while for more modern ones to be introduced. Also, most Hind models carry only four ATGMs, so its main weapons are still unguided rockets and machine guns or cannon most of the time. Meanwhile, the Army's AH-56 Cheyenne and Sikorsky S-67 Blackhawk got cancelled, though Sikorsky later used the name for the UH-61 transport helicopter. There were a few reasons for the cancellation of the AH-56 Cheyenne after years of development, cost overruns, development problems and the like, but one reason was simply that the requirements for an attack helicopter had changed by now. With the end of the US involvement in Vietnam, the focus for an attack helicopter shifted to being an anti-tank helicopter to be used in a possible Third World War in Europe, and the high-speed designs simply were not that well suited for this. With manpads and other anti-air weapons to be expected on a battlefield over Europe, flying at any kind of altitude was out of the question. And while high-speed low-level attack runs provide some protection against anti-aircraft weapons, they at the same time make the helicopter vulnerable to small arms fire and the helicopter has to get close to the enemy during its attack run. That, of course, is not a new revelation. When the British tested an early Cobra in the 60s, they came to this conclusion and that it would not be suitable for a war in Europe for those reasons. So the solution to that problem and to make a helicopter into a viable anti-tank weapon is for it to stay out of sight altogether and attack from long range from a hidden position. So you stay below radar, but also far enough away from enemy positions to not be threatened by small arms. That is the idea anyway. Most European armies adopted small utility helicopters for this role, like the French Gazelle or the Bo 105 for the Germans. Those kind of small nimble helicopters are well suited to stay hidden thanks to their small size and carry a few ATGMs to deal with tanks and other hard targets. But such a helicopter is of course a pure anti-tank weapon in this configuration and not well suited for close air support roles. With the AH-56 cancelled, the US Army was starting a new competition for modern attack helicopters with the new requirements, still looking for a replacement for their quote-unquote interim Cobras. Which, by the way, were now also much improved, carrying tow missiles and optical sights to use them at long range. Now, the new helicopter of course eventually became the AH-64 Apache. Unlike previous designs, the Apache was optimized for low-level work and fire long-range anti-tank missiles from concealments, putting a large emphasis on its anti-tank role in Europe. As a result, the AH-64 Apache does not have a retractable landing gear or the sleek aerodynamic look of, for example, the Cheyenne or the S-67. The fixed landing gear, while creating drag, is lighter and therefore means the helicopter can more easily hover with a heavy weapons load. That is something that early hind helicopters, for example, have trouble with. On the flip side, a hind is faster than most modern attack helicopters like the H-64 or also the Mi-28. Interestingly, newer hind models actually also use fixed landing gear now, trading weight for aerodynamic performance. 
Now, this kind of low-level approach of course has its own challenges. It requires a very good idea of where your own as well as enemy troops are, since you don't have the same amount of situational awareness this close to the ground than you would have if you fly at higher altitude, and if you get it wrong you might end up very close to the enemy. Pure attack helicopters like the Apache or the Cobra can in such a situation use their guns, which can be controlled by the head movement of the pilot or gunner for close range defense. But in a pure anti tank helicopter like the Gazelle you don't have that option, so you should make sure that the tree line you're hiding behind does not contain a squad of enemy infantry. But in the high threat environment those attack helicopters were designed to operate in, there is little choice, as modern radar and infrared guided weapons would be a massive threat to them if they are spotted, despite infrared and ECM jammers, which also help but have their limits. The best defense here is having a large tree or a house, as well as a few kilometers distance between you and your target. Hunting targets this way in TCS can be quite entertaining and challenging though. Now, while new attack helicopters like the Apache, Eurocopter Tiger or the Mi-28 were developed primarily for anti-tank work in Europe, it luckily never came to that, and in many of the conflicts in which they do see service modern anti-air weapons are again rare, so there is little reason to stay low within easy reach of small arms fire in those kind of conflicts. As a result, in such a case an attack helicopter would stay high again, however with more modern weapon systems it can also easily engage from outside small arms range, without having to dive into range while attacking. However, in DCS we usually have scenarios with heavier anti-air threats, where hovering around this high would be a bad idea. Well, that is a bit of an overview of some basics about attack helicopters. As always, I hope it was informative, thanks for watching and maybe I'll see you next time.